um, and not worrying about germs and stuff. And she was able to ring the, the bell this week. Um, so she is officially cancer free. Um, and interestingly, when I was talking to her about praying, and I did say what I was praying for you, she said, I've had a few friends praying for me, and one of them was called Chris and his partner Mia. I'm just going to say that's her name because I can't remember. And he said, I'm so glad that our prayers were answered. Lots of love, Christ and Mia. He'd put a T on by mistake, so I thought we were laughing about that. Um, and then she told me that her Macmillan nurse was called Faith. And I just thought there was lots of little mm. nice things off the back of that, which, yeah. Yeah, isn't it, isn't it wonderful how God works? Yeah, isn't, and also isn't medicine, which is God-inspired, wonderful? Yeah, and I think the, the thing that just blesses me so much here is we walk with our friends through their journeys. And we are just like Jesus' feet with them, aren't we? And God calls us to that this week. So I want to encourage you this week. That those pray for five. Seek an opportunity to bring God's name in whatever nuance is right into their situation. And to just, you know, we do it anyway. But brave, brave on up and have an expectation that God will bring his blessing on that situation. That God has... We know that God has the power to change everything, but we can declare that too. So thank you for being brave, sharing it with your friend and with us. Thank you. Do you know, we're going to sing our first song if the band could come up now. And I think it's just so fitting because God is worthy of it all, isn't he? He is so worthy. Whatever our journeys look like at the moment, let's focus on Jesus Christ right now and go straight into his throne room with praise and worship and adoration for him because he is truly worthy of it all. Amen. Can you stand, guys? Thank you.
situation, irrelevant to your emotions. Because you see, Psalms 33 teaches us this. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. He's got it all. He is faithful in all he does. He will not leave you this morning. Regardless of the situation that surrounds you today, he will not leave you. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And the starry host, by the breath of his mouth, he gathers the water of the seas into jars. How big is he this morning? How small is your problem? Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world stand in awe of him. I want to sing this once more. And I want you to sing your praises and your glory to the gods. And I want you to be humble before this mighty, awe-inspiring God. Because regardless of where we stand, he is a way maker. Amen. Church, let's praise his name this morning together. Hallelujah, Jesus. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working.
we're still in that, that moment of praise and worship, church. Don't lose it. Don't let it go. I want to encourage you. Um, there's just a real sense this morning as, as a church where we're going, what we're, we're really seeking and digging deep into, into God, into who Jesus is, into the Holy Spirit and what that means for your life. And I just really feel, as, as Dawn has uh, just already said, um, we look to God as the one who keeps us. Amen? And just as we've been singing these words and we've just been um, singing truth over our lives, into our lives, I'm just reminded, for some of us, no, I'm not going to say some of us, all of us need to be reminded of this, that God is Jehovah Nissi. That means he's your banner. You wave a banner of God over your life. I wave a banner of God over my life. He has defeated death. We are on the winning side and we need to be reminded of that this morning, church. What a wonderful promise that is. Psalm 62, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. So in these next few moments, church, let's just sing that now. I will not be shaken in this moment. If you're watching from home or you're here this morning, whatever situation you're in, Jehovah Nissi, he is your banner over your life. I will not be shaken. Jesus, we lift up your name, Jesus. Jesus. Lord, we want more of you, more power, more love. Jesus. Jesus your name is the name above all names your enemies are your footstool we declare in this place Lord you are Jehovah Nissi you are our rock and our salvation every person that calls on the name of the Jesus in uh, on the name of Jesus in this place may they have a fresh reminder a fresh revealing, Lord, that they are on the winning side. May we just wallow in that truth, Lord, this morning. That Jesus, you have defeated death, you have risen from the grave. And there is nothing that can stop you, Lord. And in these moments, Lord, we simply declare we love you. We adore you. We say you are beautiful and amazing. Lord, we're not worthy, but through your grace and your mercy, in your eyes, we are worthy. And we are thankful. And all God's people said, amen, and amen, and amen. Please do take your seats. Let's give these guys a round of applause just for leading us so wonderfully. Wow. It's so wonderful when a church family come together and worship God together. Isn't it amazing? I get just so blown away, just stood at the back watching you guys worship. You inspire me. And I love it. It's great to come together and just to, just to uh, worship 
King Jesus. Um, this morning, church, we are, on, uh, we are going through a series of Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. We, we started off this series that we are all going to be looking at, where it's power of everyone. The power of everyone. Now that means the power of everyone means everyone. We're all included in that. Amen? Amen. We've got nowhere to hide from Jesus. Amen? Amen. He sees and knows everything. Excellent. That's, that's, that frightens me when we say that. That Jesus sees and knows everything. You go, uh oh. Especially when I'm driving my car. But the thing is, this morning we're going through the series in Acts 2, The Power of Everyone. And Steve kicked us off last week with it. Who was here last week? Wasn't Steve really animated? He was on, yeah, he was on fire. I'm surprised he didn't do a little dance. He probably, yeah, he probably did. But Steve kicked us off with Acts 2, 42 to 47, where he delved into this clear and obvious picture of the early church, what was started in and through the Holy Spirit. And none of that's changed. The Holy Spirit hasn't changed, amen? So if you've got your Bibles with you, whether it's digital or paper, turn with me to Acts 2, 42 to 47, and we're going to have a recap of that. And I'm excited, church of what God's got in store for us. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, your backgrounds, what you're facing. God has got something in store for you. The fellowship of believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property, they sold possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And it was the Lord that added to their number daily those who were being saved. Does anyone want to see a New Testament church? Do we want to see people being saved? It's a really clear depiction that they were all in this together. Okay? Now, if you've ever watched High School Musical, you'll know that there's a song called All In This Together. Maybe that's our anthem. My family are now singing it. If you really want to have that song going around in your mind, YouTube it. I'm not going to sing it. That's not what I'm going to do. But they were in it together. No one was left out. They were in it together. Each person being a part of the body of Christ as this new early church started to do what God had envisioned it to do. And it really was the power of everyone. Steve reminded us that they were devoted. Do you remember last week? Devoted. There was devotion. They all they were all devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. These four things were a catalyst for God's kingdom as he worked amongst his people, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. These were the four things they were devoted to that birthed the church and went everywhere. They were devoted. If you're part of a small group, this is just an add-on. If you're part of a small group, you'll be digging deeper into this series as we travel together and journey together as small groups. We're doing it to see the impact it should be having and the change you should be seeing as we look at this passage of scripture. If you're not doing that in your small groups, you'll have to have a word with your small group leaders. But that's what we're doing because we want as a church to move together, to go into this together. But Steve looked at those four things, the devotion to those four things. But this morning, I'm looking at verse 43, which simply tells us that the people were in awe of the church. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Before we dig into that and we look around at scripture and the implications that this verse presents to us, what it really means and how we can be challenged by it, has there ever been a time you've ever been in awe of someone or something? Can you think of something right now that you're in awe of? Like mind-blowing, eyebrow-raising, jaw-dropping wonderment that you've just witnessed something so amazing? Yeah. I've been to places all around the world and just God's creation is fantastic, Yeah. yeah? Even here in Western Supermare, yeah. 
God's creation is fantastic. It's perfect. It's perfect. I apologize. It's perfect. It is. But if you have ever been in awe of someone, can you think of someone in your life that you've just gone, wow, that person's amazing? As many times I've been in awe of Pastor Steve. How can someone support Sheffield Wednesday with a straight face? Hats off to you, Steve. This is coming from a man who supports Bolton Wanderers. Uh, what do you mean, who? I joke. I have. I have been in awe of Steve. In all honesty or seriousness, I have. Because of his passion and his love for Jesus. And wanting to see people do things. Moving to Nepal with his family. I'm in awe of that. I struggled to move from Gloucester to, to, to Derby. But it's those things you're in awe of people. I've got to do this. Uh, normally, the wives or husbands of the minister, uh, they, they get the butt of the jokes, don't they? Or they, they're picked on because, you know, it's standard uh, uh, common practice. But my wife is pretty awesome. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you glad they all agreed? <laughs> she has this knack, okay? We've been married 20 odd years, 22, three years, a few years. Um, amen? Uh, and she has this knack of being able to do anything that she turns her hand to. She's just able to crack on and do it. And it, it, it annoys me because I try and do something and I can't do it. She does it. Yeah, not an issue. She makes it look so easy. She started a new role in her job in September. And as far as I'm told by people that work with her, she's acing it. She just gets on with it and does it. She does respite. On a Monday and Tuesday, we look after two kids. And she's just phenomenal the way she just gets on and does it. She, she, she just does all these things, and I'm in awe of her. On top of that, she's a top-tier mum and a top-tier wife too. And it's God, a constant reminder that he really does send people to help those in need. Amen? <laughs> but just so she doesn't get that much of a bigger head, I'm still the better driver. <laughs> and also... Do you remember when we went axe throwing and you couldn't do it? So one thing she can't do. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me. Keeping her humble. But there's one person in my life. Um, well, there's lots of people in my lives, obviously. But there's one person, my brother Lee. So a few of you met Lee. He was six years older than me. And I remember times of just being awe of my bigger brother. Okay? Like seeing him sticking up for my cousin who had a disability at school. She was a year younger. And she was picked on because kids are mean, aren't they? But my brother literally fought anyone who said anything or did anything against her. And she wasn't picked on again. Lee was always a hard one in my family. How once he came to my work when I worked in a warehouse. We, uh, I was buying a motorbike and he came to look at it. He's, he was a manager of a bike shop. He loved bikes. Always has. Always will. And he turned up on this bike, and we had a one-way system in our car park. You came in, you went down along straight, and come back out. He came up on this bike. For any of you that know bikes, he was on a Ducati 916. Okay? They sound really nice. But not only did it sound really nice, it had aftermarket exhausts. Akropovich, I could be speaking double Dutch to some people, but those of you in the know will know. And this was a loud bike. It sounded phenomenal. So he pulls up, he checks over the bike, and he says, yeah, it's great. Go and buy it. I've got to get back to work. So what he does, he goes off and goes round. Now, my brother doesn't do things by halves. And if he can show off, he would. And what he did on this bike, he did a big wheelie. Down the entire car park of where I worked. Not only did he do a, a wheelie, he set off car alarms. I kid you not. <laughs> the exhausts were that loud, the alarms were going off on several cars as he went down on his back wheel. And to top it off... He came and left at just the right time as all the managers were coming out of the office. So not only is he pulling a wheelie, he's setting car alarms off and all the managers are going, who's that idiot going down our car park? And I'm going, it's my brother. I'm in awe of him. I remember doing a wheelie on my motorbike and I thought it was massive. It was probably about that high. But my brother could get it on the back wheel and he could go for miles. I was in awe. But probably the main thing for me my brother's love of bikes was probably his downfall. The main one for me that I'm in awe of my brother is he had a bad accident in 2004, 19 years ago. And after this, it nearly cost him his life. 
The many things he's battled with and against, a change of persona, uh, a change of character, everything. His battle with alcohol, with, with depression, and all these things that come in. Yet still, he always puts people first. Yet still, he battles through all this. And I'm in awe of the positivity and hope in his life. And I'm glad and thankful to say that he has accepted Jesus into his life all those years ago. But I'm in awe of a person who has taken this huge hit, yet still goes on. And I'm sure that you can think of many people that you're in awe of. But when you step back and you look at scripture and you look at your own personal faith, your own life and where you go in, what about God? Are you today in awe of God? How much am I in awe of my Lord and Savior on a daily basis? Do I even give it much thought? And I want to challenge you this morning, church. If we're to move forward, we've got to take this seriously. We've got to think about it. We've got to go deeper into Scripture to see why people were in awe of God. You see, when you read it, it's not just the people who were there, the apostles and all those that were in awe. It was the people looking into the church. Those, those who were outside were looking in and going, there's something happening there. There's great things happening. They saw wonders and signs as the Holy Spirit moved amongst the apostles. What was the key here? What was the secret source the apostles had? Well, it was the Holy Spirit. I mean, we have the Holy Spirit though, don't we? But there was a passion, a yearning, a yielding to God at that moment and for the rest of their lives. That they would say, God, I've seen you move. I've seen you do things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life to you. Everything that I am, I give to you. Move through me. And the people were in awe. So what did the apostles have that we don't have? Now, I'm not pointing the finger and trying to make you feel guilty or, or pick on people, because I look at myself. Because we have the same Holy Spirit, right? He is unchanging, never ceasing, always on the move, looking for people. So is it the yearning and the yielding that is the difference? Have we kind of taken like a back seat in our faith to say, well, let's just do what we've always done? If you want a New Testament church, we've got to raise our game. I thought about doing this and I didn't. I chickened out. If I was to ask the average person on the high street, can you imagine going down and asking someone if they were in awe of the local church? What do you think they would say? How many people think you'd be laughed at? How many think you'd say you're talking out your hat? What are you on about? The church? You see, as much as the church does good with many things, we we do lots of good things, not just HT, but the church as general. It's like the church as a whole is more social action at the moment than God-fearing. Are we a God-fearing church? How many of us fear God? I'll come on to that word in a moment. Hebrews 12, 28 to 29 has this wonderful picture of just one simple or two simple verses where we should be forever thankful and grateful to God, where we look at him and say, I'm in awe of what you have done. It says this, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. If you're a Christian here this morning, you are receiving and being given a kingdom that cannot be shaken, cannot be moved, cannot be touched. Nothing can overcome it. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. I had to sit and read through these and just be reminded of, through Christ, what we've inherited, a kingdom that cannot be shaken, a kingdom that cannot be moved, and a God who is a consuming fire will consume everything else except that. And for me, I read it and I, I, it just brings me back to a place of repeating gratitude to say to God, knowing that the God who created heaven and earth, a God so holy and immense, would make himself known to me. That alone makes me kneel and be in awe of God. When we look at the chaos and instability of the world, I, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm glad and I'm amazed that I'm a part of a kingdom that will not be shaken. And not only that, we continue to receive this kingdom. But what about that word fear? Well, I talked about awe. What about that word fear that I used? Are we God-fearing? Do you fear God? 
You see in verse 43 um, of Acts 2, some versions use the word fear. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. There was fear there. And when we read scripture, when you read especially the Old Testament, there's this running undercurrent of awe, reverence, and fear towards God. As a church as a whole, have we lost that wonderment of awe, fear, and reverence to God? I wonder. Do we even look at him in those ways? When we, when we go back to Scripture, it's a timely reminder that all fear and reverence to God is not something we are to take lightly. It's not something that we, we are just to look at and go, yeah, isn't that nice? Yes, I do. Because if we don't have that, if there is no fear to Almighty God, in truth and love, there's something wrong there. There's something wrong in our lives. Because we're not putting God where he should be. And we're going to use scripture to guide and reveal to us why this is. An ending, hopefully, back up at Acts 2.43. See, the word fear, as if I said to you fear, has connotations towards negative things, right? It evokes a sense of danger or something unpleasant that maybe is yet to happen or will happen. You're fearful or you fear something. Yet we understand God to be a loving father, a good God, slow to anger, full of grace and mercy. That's what scripture tells us. So there seems to be a contradiction. Yet we have to go into scripture to see what it really means. So if he is a good God, then why should we fear him? Well, one author writes this about C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, who wrote The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. And he says this in, in the film, uh, in the book, it has a conversation between two people. And it says, when Mr. Beaver tells Susan that Aslan, the ruler of Narnia, is a great lion, Susan is surprised since she assumed Aslan was a man. She then tells Mr. Beaver, I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. She asks Mr. Beaver if Aslan is safe, to which Mr. Beaver replies, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's a king. See, this book is, is like a picture of Christ. Aslan is that Christ picture. See, I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Would you feel nervous about meeting Jesus, the lion of Judah? But he's good, he's a king. And that gives us a picture of our King Jesus, that he is good. He is a king. For me, he is a safe refuge, a safe sanctuary. Yet being God, almighty God, he isn't safe. And when we delve into scripture, especially the Old Testament, God was far from safe. You see, the Old Testament is littered with passages. I love the Old Testament just because it's absolutely mad, bonkers, right? But it's littered um, with passages that refer to the fear of God that the Israelites had. And the Israelites saw firsthand, witnessed firsthand, were close to God. And they knew that they should be fearful of him. Because what he did to the enemies, he could do to them. In fact, we read, and you can go and look for yourselves, that God was to be feared. You see, the Israelites saw plagues brought upon Egypt as they were taken out of Egypt. When they were being rescued, they saw locusts, frogs, flies, the Nile uh, River turned to blood, darkness over all of Egypt, and killing of king's firstborn sons, to name but a few. If God can do that to them, he can do that to us. They followed Almighty God as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And they watched as he parted the Red Sea, allowing them safe passage out of Egypt, and then observing as the water came together again, swallowing the pursuing Egyptian army. Now, if I saw that, if you saw that, would you be in fear of God? I would be in awe and reverence and fear. But what did the Israelites do? What were they like? How many of you are quick to forget things? The Israelites were quick to forget. They were quick to go back to their old thinking, their old habits, their old ways. They forgot that somehow Almighty God had put, had put fear inside them, but they forgot all the things that he did. Somehow the power and might of God that rescued them became a distant memory. Oh, how we are so like the Israelites. 
You see, as God came to Mount Sinai to meet Moses, we're told that the mountain trembled, fire and smoke were all around, thunder, lightning, trumpet blasts were heard. The Israelites feared in that moment, exhorting Moses, you go and speak to God. We don't want to speak to him. We are fearful. You go and do it, Moses. We'll speak to you, Moses, because you're just a man. There was all reverence and fear. But did it last? Did it echo? They created an idol to worship because Moses was taking too long. It's a picture of church, isn't it? Church is taking too long, so I just go in. You're taking too long, so I just... We forget Almighty God. See, one commentator explains that the Israelites were slow on the uptake of actually recognizing it was God's goodness as well. They were accustomed with the perception of God not being safe, but they struggled with believing he was good. They simply lack the trust. Israel time and again reverted to thinking their way was better than God's way. Their own sense of goodness was better than God's goodness. You see, the other nations surrounded Israel had crafted gods of their own who were not perceived as safe. They feared punishment from their gods if they didn't do this, or they didn't step correctly, or they didn't do that. They would be punished. So they made sacrifices. They followed strict rules and traditions. But the God of Israel, the true God, the only God, was not looking for this type of fear, but a fear burst out of the knowledge of his character. Church, do you know God this morning? Do you know his character? Yes, absolutely, God is big, scary, powerful, and unlike any other God of any nation. But our God is, is, is lowly. He is humble. He is compassionate. He is loving. He is forbearing. He is personal. See, the Israelites were meant to fear their God differently than other nations. They had to believe that he was a good God. And when we acknowledge God's goodness, this is where we find that reverence and fear are rooted. We turn from our sin, we turn from our our selfish ways, and we replace it with a yearning and a yielding to God in our lives. They looked on in awe at the church as it signs and wonders were performed by the apostles. They saw great things because they they yearned for God. They yielded their lives to him. And the one major difference that we have today is the approach we take to God. Whereas the Israelites were happy for Moses to do all the talking and they stayed at a safe distance, we have a new covenant. Amen? There are now no limits for us in our approach to him. We can approach his throne with confidence. Humbly, but with confidence. And this is a picture of the apostles in Acts 2. But can you imagine if we're in the Old Covenant? Steve, can you go and talk to God for us? We're too scared. We're going to sit at the back. But if you can go and speak to God, that would be great. Here's my list of things. Off you go. It doesn't work, does it? That's why God created the New Covenant, where we can approach his throne with confidence at any point, at any time throughout the day. The fear of God is not about keeping our distance, but about drawing nearer to him. It's interesting how we take our lead from Jesus when it comes to living godly lives. Jesus had everything right. All of the disciples looked at Jesus and followed his example. We now look at Jesus and we say, we want to follow your example. There's a thing, though, that Jesus did. We read in Isaiah 11 of a prophecy regarding Jesus, okay? And it's a part of a description of his nature. And it's interesting when you read this, what it says. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. These two sentences. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. This is a prophecy about Jesus. Those things would be in his characteristics. Jesus went and understood what it was to fear his father. Fear of the Lord was a characteristic upon the Messiah, giving us that clear perspective of Jesus, who was willing, willingly kept himself in a place of submission, respect, and honor to God the Father. And we follow his example. We follow that example like we follow the apostles' example as they submitted, respected, and honored God the Father. You see, true fear of God 
draws near in faith. Fearing God because of who he is and realizing he is a God full of grace and mercy. Do we recognize his matchless power as the creator of all things? The recognition of God's complete and perfect holiness, his purity, perfection and separation from evil. Acknowledging the blessings that we receive from God, especially for the forgiveness of our sins on a daily basis and so much more. We draw close to him. See, the apostles and all those involved understood the complete magnificence of God. There are no words to, de to describe who God is, is there? We can run out of them. That he alone is worthy. He alone is worthy. And that through Jesus' example, they found themselves at the beginning of God's glorious mission. They understood that God was to be feared and revered. They were in awe of him. They did what was asked of them. And they went and changed the world. And this is where we find ourselves back at verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe and the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. We serve a God who is not to be trifled with. We serve a God who doesn't mess around. He alone has the authority and power over all things. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And when you look at it, we have the audacity not to approach him with all reverence and fear. Who do we think we are? Who do we think we are? But ultimately, we have grace and mercy that overflows. Ultimately, the follower of Jesus, for the follower of Jesus, fearing God brings us a humble confidence and an overwhelming spiritual comfort that we're in his presence. The New Testament directly links the fear of the Lord with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. You see, for those who do not fear God, they will have little or no sense of his presence or protection. But those who fear God and obey his word will experience a deep sense of spiritual security, anointing and empowering of the Holy Spirit. See, our love for God stems from, is tied into and is out of that initial awe, reverence and fear of the Lord our God. See, the people looking into the church who were filled with awe at the signs and wonders being done by the apostles did so because those, God, those apostles were yielding to God. They were yearning for God. They had passion. Now, I'm not saying that's not us, but I truly believe if we see God, we want to see God move and do things, we need to step up our game. We need to take it to the next level. We need to go deeper in our faith, deeper in everything that we are about church. See, when we as God's church humble ourselves and express that awe, reverence, fear over him who is over all things, I truly believe that, that the world will sit up and take notice. I truly believe that the, the world, the people outside, will, will see a difference in you. We talk about it all the time. There's something different about you. Imagine taking that to the next level. The world will sit up and take notice of a God who has been in charge since the beginning of time. That the world will see a church who, who gets stuff done. And I don't mean just putting on ministries and doing things, but we get stuff done. Things get sorted. Truth is allowed to be seen and heard. Signs and wonders will abound in the church. Anyone else want to see signs and wonders? Anyone? One or two? Sign up at the back. But the reason why the world sat up and took notice is because these guys were allowing the Holy Spirit to lead them. I think now is an opportunity for change as a church. Not just Holy Trinity, but the church in general. That we can now change the atmosphere, the spiritual, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Young and old and everyone in between. People who come in. We have the opportunity to change. Imagine what it would look like for people out there to look in and be filled with awe. Imagine what it would look like if people were saying, something going on there. And it will be God who adds to their numbers daily. I just want to invite you to stand if you can. 
we're not going to sing a song. We're, we're going to come to a close in a moment. <clears throat> just want to ask you for no other reason. Um, it's just a sign of, of just saying to the Lord, fill me. Just putting your hands up, you can put them by your waist. It's, it's, it's not spiritual, it's not something that we do. Um, it's, just, it's just like an outward sign of saying, Lord, do you know what? I recognize who you are. Lord, allow me to be in awe of you this morning. Allow me to revisit who you are in my life. Lord, every single day, let me get on my knees and say, Lord, the fear of you that I have brings me closer to you. It's not a fear that is negative, but a positive. It is a fear that is born out of your grace and mercy that overflows. And I pray, Lord, as even as I stood at the back and watched as we worship, Lord, we have a healthy church. We have a great family here at Holy Trinity. But Lord, there's more. Not more stuff to do, not more things that we have to sign up for, but there's more of you. Lord, we want more of you. We sang the songs, more love, more grace, more mercy, more of you in our lives, Lord. And I pray if that's you this morning, you don't have to do anything. It's between you and God now that you would say, Lord, more of you, less of me. I'm going to invite you just to pray. You can pray in silence. You can pray in your own tongue. You can pray out loud. In these moments, we invite God to say, Lord, you are welcome here. Doesn't that sound crazy? We're welcoming the, the creator of earth, the creator of the heavens. We're saying, Lord, you're welcome in my life. <laughs> but Lord, you are so welcome. And I pray, Lord, that every person that is hearing this morning, give them ears to hear. Give them a heart that is open. Give them a soul that is ready to be refreshed by your Holy Spirit. And I ask, Lord, that this wouldn't just be a Sunday thing, but would be a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday thing, that we would go into this world. And I pray, Lord, that we would have, uh, like Laura came and presented earlier, Lord, people would be in awe of the church. And Lord, I know, I trust, I believe that you will add to the numbers, not just here, but across the churches of this town. In a world of chaos, in a world of darkness, May the church arise and be the light in the darkness. And Lord, we give you, you all the honor and all the glory. Everything that is due your name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Please do take your seats. Thank you so much for listening so well. Just got, uh, before you all rush off and run away, just uh, one more thing. Just to announce, um, Trans End Skate Park. For those of you who are maybe new or visiting, we have a skate park. Yay! Excellent. We are going down to the campus on the half term, February half term, which is the 12th to the 16th. We will be down there. There's loads of these flyers at the back. If you want to grab one, maybe give them to some friends or families. Um, if you would like to come and volunteer for a day or for a couple of hours, come and see myself. Or uh, Andy Skirm. Andy, please stand up. Give us a wave. Beautiful man. If you would like to come down and, and have a go, please do sign up. Or just come and chat to us. I'd love you to be able to pray for this. I know you do, but I'd love you just to, to, to lift your prayers for Transend and just, just pray that it will be fruitful and we would see many great things. It's already creating a new buzz around town, but we used to go in the Tropicana and now we're at the campus um, over by Morrison's. So it's, it's a new start, a new venture, and we're really excited for it. And there's lots of great stuff happening. So if you could do that, that'd be brilliant. Um, apart from that, I think that's it, isn't it, Dawn? We're all done. Do you want me to keep them here for another 10 minutes till 12 or... No. Bless you guys. You are free to go and drink tea and coffee. Have a great, blessed rest of the day and the week. We'll see you at either Alpha or the prayer meeting. Amen.